first time I discovered your music was when I was very young, I was probably about 12 or 13 years old. Now, I come from, I grew up in the 80s, and the 80s was a terrible music decade. So yeah, that's what I found terrible. the same, yes. And as a, as a young sort of teenager or even younger, I found it very hard to find anyone that I could be a fan of. Mm -hmm. So I find myself going back still, I think this is there, I find myself going back to the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. And one of my best friends had a big brother who was a big fan of so-called progressive rock. And we used to basically um, raid his record collection. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one of these. So we would discover bands like um, Pink Floyd, Camel, Hawkwind. Hawkwind, I like very much. Well. Yeah. And then one day I discovered uh, in his collection an album by Bank of Tangerine Dream. And I became a very big fan of Tangerine Dream, and so did he. And we were always, I guess, looking for music that would... I mean, when, when you're a kid you're trying to discover music, you kind of follow the path. Mm -hmm. So you find one band and that leads you to another and that leads you to another and to another. And, and I think I heard your name and eventually my friend bought one of your albums from h and or at Virgin Rocks, Virgin Rocks from Oxford Street. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I have to say at this point, the first time I heard it, I didn't like it. And it's like all music that I really love, I don't like it the first time I hear it. Really? Yeah. Really. And i tell you the reason, the thing about Tangerine Dream was, Tangerine Dream wrote in a very kind of modular way. So there would be one piece that would go on for about three or four minutes, then they would kind of stop, and there'd be a transition to another section of three or four minutes, and there'd be another transition to... It was a very modular way of writing, bits kind of strung together, which was a very progressive approach. Mm. And at the time, I loved that. So here's this album, double album, it was live, by the way, Clash Short's live. Here's the double album, with four, <laughs> with four 30 minute pieces on it. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting for the, the development in the pieces. And there isn't really much in the way of development. And so I, I, I found that, first I found that quite surprising, secondly, very hard to connect with. Now, I'm the opposite, and that's exactly the reason I love your music so much, and I'm not really listening so much to bands like Tangerine Dream. Because now... Well, they changed that. Uh, well, but even their early albums where... Oh, I love Ricochet and Tedra were really nice. I still like them, but I find, as I've, as I've got older, my listening tastes have changed. And what I'm looking for now is when I put on an album, I want to immerse myself. Immerse? What is that? Um, sink myself. I like that. Sink yeah. myself into a, a kind of sound world for, mm -hmm. for an hour or, or, or two hours or whatever. And I don't want so much change. I want atmosphere and I want texture. Mm -hmm. And your music still, for me, is perfect for that. And and uh, and for me, it grows better with age. Whereas for some of the other music I listen to as a kid now, I find it hard to to, to listen to and relate to so much. Ah. And and those out like albums like Time Wind and, and Black Dance, Cyber. <laughs> Black Dance. I love Black Dance. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's okay. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people like it, but I I thought it's for me it's like a folklore album. You know? <laughs> so I think it's I the only album which I really say I couldn't have skipped that one. Really? Yeah, because I mean I tried to play acoustic guitar and I played congas and. Uh, the only thing is a bit, oh, it's just nice, it's the voices of sin with the opera singers, and it's a bit like that, what I was thinking, going to do later on. Right. But uh, that, uh, I think the nicest thing on the record is the cover, you know. <laughs> well, I love the cover too. The, the, the second side is the, is the, the masterpiece for me, that album. I think what that album has, which I, again I like a, about a lot of, I know you're not so keen on the, the sort of cosmic, yeah, this is yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this, just the name is so obvious, it's like to explain the joke. Yeah. yeah, but in a way I understand why, because it, it's almost like some of those albums from that period do feel like they're almost coming from another dimension. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so Cosmic, although it's not an ideal, so it's kind of, in a way it's kind of trivialised the music, I kind of see where that came from. There's something about the music that just seems like it's beaming in from another planet. Mm -hmm. It's strange music. Yes, I think the promoters, you know, they thought it's called cosmic. Uh, I mean, the cosmic music, I could, uh, I okay, like this, but then 
it said uh, the cosmic careers, you know. Yeah. And I mean, this is like a, it is like a, a, a post guy who's just <laughs> bringing you a telegram, you know, so they know I'm cosmic yeah. career, you know, you know, DHL or what. Well, that was kind of cheesy, yeah. yeah. No, but it was kind of this, at this time, you know, all the people just thought uh, we are mad in Germany. And I said, oh, they are just on drugs and they don't know what they do, they're stupid and idiots. Mm -hmm. And so, as a guy from a record company, uh, tries to find a, a term where how he could sell it with an okay, they said it's, it's a bit out of a normal taste, but to give it a name, and then he just took this stupid thing, cosmic music, and we are, the musicians are the cosmic careers, and uh, since then I said, God damn. Which yeah, yeah. But, it, it, but for that's the same thing. They made a kind of serious with uh, cosmic careers, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is such a stupid stuff because when it was a bit, uh, let's say, a big studio mm -hmm. you know, near Cologne, and uh, then we were invited by the uh, producer and also the, uh, the owner of the record company. And when we came into the studio, we have to take a trip. It was next to the door. It's like you come in the door, there was a, the table like this, and there was a trip, and then it was looking that you just take one. You know, okay. And then you were allowed to go in the recording room. Okay. And uh, as far as we went in there, uh, they had the 24 tracks running, mm -hmm. and uh, we just had to play. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, we just had to play. And of course, if you're on the trip, you know, I play bass or just the instrument with a piano with Peter Baumer from Tangerine. We did it forehand, piano pieces, and all this shit, you know. And we never heard about it ever after. Mm -hmm. Because we thought it was a nice evening, we just jammed a bit, you know. And then the Sunday, we saw that they brought all of these things out without telling us and asking us. And they just both, uh, the engineer and the producer, had no sense of music in right. So he put things together, but the American and the English, I think because it's so crazy, stupid, or wrong, they think they, they like it, you know, they think it's so absurd, you know. Well, it, it's, like a, it's like a cosmic jam session. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. Yeah, like that, yeah. But uh, it's, it's, I think it's not, not even worse to release it, but. Uh, the Americans are just mad about it. Yeah. Have, you listened, have you heard it recently? Have you listened to it in the last 20, 30 years? Well, I, I <laughs> don't want it. Not anymore. I okay. listened to it somewhere by accident when we uh, were talking about real releases, you know, and uh, yeah. I listened to it and I listened also to the first tension dream that were played with electronic meditation. I said, God damn it, man. <laughs> Well, if this there are people that love those records, particularly electronic meditation is considered a... And it's, weird, it's a weird one. I mean, it is yeah. kind of a... Uh, what I like on the album is, I mean, uh, musically, okay, but uh, it is the beginning of the search. Right. Where we're going to... Where nobody knew where we mm. uh, would go with it, but it was kind of a... Let's say for us, I think it's kind of a punk album, you know. Yeah. You destroy everything what you know, right. but we were not yet ready to to build something new there, you know. It was just uh, before we destroyed everything, and then after a couple of years, and then Dream made Fader and Sight, and then the Baby King, and then Time Wind, and Black Dance, and Picture Music, and all this. Mm -hmm. But at this time, you know, we just want sort to of kill everything mm -hmm. what we had before, because I don't know, you cannot know that, but in Germany, normally, we are just kind of copying English and American bands. Otherwise, you have hardly no chance of being uh, successful, you know. It changed in the 80s, and it came some German music, you know, like New Waves and kind of stuff. And then we have also some rock bands like Scorpions, but I mean, these kind of bands you find everywhere in England mm -hmm. and, in, and every corner in America, you know. But for us, it's a very good band. For German measurements, <laughs> yeah. and uh, so we said, no, we don't want to copy anymore this English and American stuff. We want to do our own music. And in the beginning of the seventies, there were a lot of kind of spacey bands, you know, the, the Pink Floyd stuff, you know, and Hawkwind was we said before, you know, and uh, Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane. It's a shock because that always was kind of steady going. You know. Was uh, was Stockhausen? Well, 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 no. 
No, I mean, other, other people, it's a big myth, I think, said Dirk Hausen was kind of, uh, had something to do with electronic music. He has actually nothing to do with electronic music. It's kind of an image which was somehow by the journalist. In fact, of his whole composition, he did about 5% was, if you want to call it electronic, it was just uh, having one oscillator make it that's all. And uh, what he did is, was in, uh, in Osaka, you know, he had a, uh, a big wall. Yeah, the X470. And they had a lot of speakers, and then he yeah. had all this to might be. But at least, like, you must have heard Contactor from 1959. And the Jungling, the Jungling, the Jungling. They're incredible, aren't they? You think it's just too much messing about an oscillator? It's like a and oscillator. I thought I wanted a studio uh, to. But, and uh, I think uh, for him it was also not uh, the aim to have electronic, it was just to do something weird, what is not done before, because it well, was a combination of God, you know. Yeah. Sometimes music that's very kind of cerebral and very intellectual can be an influence on people. Like, I mean, there are other examples of band that I think music that was very intellectual, but people took that. I mean, I think a lot of people have taken Stockhausen's ideas. And made them much more human and much more from the soul and the heart. Yeah, if you read his books, I read his books, you know, you think, oh God, I have to listen to the music. But yeah. when you listen to the music, it's the opposite of that, actually, what she was, uh, he was writing. You it's know? very, he's very cold intellectual. But I, I do hear, I definitely do hear a strand of that moving into certain things like Pink Floyd and your early music and Tangerine Dream and Clash Shorts. Um, and I'm surprised to hear you say that, you, that, that you're certainly not. Conscious of that. For us in uh, in Germany, uh, for the electronic people, he was just kind of our uh, god, you know. Kind so of, guys like Kang like, were not listening to. No, not really. Except uh, like Kang, yes, uh, because Owen Schmidt, uh, 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 let's say a pupil of him. Oh, you and uh, also a couple of other, uh, like uh, Connie Schnitzler, so on. Right. And uh, but uh, that is. They do this kind of music because they didn't want to go on with this, uh, with this intellectual kind of uh, school music, you know. And uh, with it uh, done, is kind of, a, let's say, also the first influence because it's, and you can take something from that. But we definitely did not in, in Berlin, all, uh, not Astra, uh, Tangerine or me, we never did something of this because for us it was a kind of a. Uh, Establishment already, you know, okay. we said, oh, no way, this okay. guy, you know. Okay. Uh, a different thing is for me was kind of uh, the music concrete from his friends, like Pierre Louis, Pierre Schemer. Mm -hmm. This was really great, but this, you know, uh, also like Steve Wright, Terry Riley, and uh, Philip Glass, mm -hmm. stuff, we learned 10 years later, uh, wow. just to get in touch with them, because then there were kind of festivals where we played and those guys are playing okay. and then we listened to it and that was a thing in Berlin in the National Gallery I heard the first time uh, Steve Wright music for 18 musicians right. I was just blown you know I said oh god damn it I mean I, I, I was I said oh the pure musician can't <laughs> play that so, so when, when this thing with with Steve particularly your music long very long durations come from I don't know why, but I think it's uh, because it, uh, when I was uh, very young, at uh, 40, 50, I listened to classical music and there was kind of this length there. But I don't know whether it really was influenced, and I think it, uh, from my point of view, as far I want to have a very subtle uh, development, I need this kind of long uh, pieces because the intro of mine is normally singular, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, so I probably, if I do the sound thing with the EMS and things like that, uh, it takes till the thing is really, let's say, is working uh, or is influencing you. Okay. It needs the five or ten minutes, you know, because that's the thing if you make short pieces, you know. You, uh, I think if you just, you just fell into this kind of a dream world, you know, and you stop the piece, you know, that's a reason I probably, because Tangerine Dream in the beginning also did this kind of long yes. pieces, and Asher also, but uh, they... They both stopped early on, I mean, Tang I, they both stopped doing that very early on in their career. Yes, because it was, uh, uh, Tangerine Dream was because they went to America, and did yeah. mostly soundtracks, right. and the Americans want to have short pieces, that's okay. one of the things they don't, 
thought uh, that it's a long piece, it's too boring, they have to go around to get popcorn, then whatever, you know. And uh, I, Edgar, I was talking to Edgar at this time, and he said, Klaus, it's not a country for your, your kind of music. If you don't change. And so I said to him, you know, with a joke between us, I said, okay, and Edgar, you take America, I take Europe. You say that it was the soundtrack thing, it was the influence, but even on hours like Phaedra, it's already moving towards a kind of very narrative, you know, sections of music. Yeah, but I like it. Like, I like, 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 like that. Don't get me wrong, I love Phaedra, I love Ringo Khan, I love Richard. But they are already moving towards a more kind of modular way of constructing music. Whereas your music has always been about just letting the atmosphere breathe and flow. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just curious about where that came from. I, mean, I don't know either. You know, the, the people said, you know, where I got to point out, they said, where, where do you get your inspiration from? You know, I don't know. I think for me it just happened, and uh, it was even if I started my first record, like early, you know, with one piece, was one time, and it never changed. And whenever I don't, maybe it's like that that I get used to it. I don't know because, or I need this time to express myself or to turn you on, you know, like this. I don't know why it was like that, and I never touched the rules, you know, even if there are no rules, but. It comes just by itself, you know. And uh, as long as I like it, you know, uh, I don't touch it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I bet I would not say, oh, uh, 30 minutes it should, uh, should be a shorter one. And even in the concert, I do uh, normally uh, 45 minutes pieces and then I make a break and other 45 minutes. And sometimes it's like that now when I play with Lisa. I just do a short piece just alone, and then uh, I just can do kind of a cross fade to uh, pieces later. Then the pieces are of course shorter, mm -hmm. but uh, if I play alone, then it's still the long pieces. Mm -hmm. Even if there's uh, maybe two or three pieces actually inside, but uh, you don't feel that. You know, it's, it's going really going in like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's not so like stopping and starting. You know. And um, I don't know where it comes from. It's, it's well, maybe it's the classical, as you said, the classical music tradition. Because even even when you do have several pieces on an album, they seem to be part of a suite. Yeah, right. Like the new album with Lisa, the, 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 the seven titles is it on the album? Yes. But they seem all part of a, a sequence. This, because I think if this is one session, you know, yeah. even if, you, if it's different pieces, uh, they have uh, done uh, they are uh, done in the same. Let's say in two days, for example, and uh, it is also if you if I do album in a very sh short breaks, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it, it, they sound the same. I have at least to wait one year that it sounds different. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, for some people, all my albums sound the same. You know, but uh, if you are sensitive when you go inside uh, and you do have a break just of one or two months. Mm -hmm. Then uh, your uh, that will sound a bit the same because you're mentally into that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't uh, do concept albums, conceptual ones. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, before I start to do music, I don't think about music. I just play either with the drums. I start with groove or with the sequence or with uh, pads, you know. But I never wanted one. This I like very much with Lisa because she's exactly the same, you know. She didn't want to even hear music before. When she was in my studio, and I said, Lisa, I prepared uh, four pieces or five pieces, uh, so which one do you want to start? I play to. Don't play to me. I don't want to listen to it. And I just uh, put on record and I sing, you know. This is, this is what Robert Fripp does too. If he comes along for sessions, he says, Don't play the music. All he knows what key is in. Exactly. Well, yes, yes, yes. I think because you musicians don't need to talk about it, you know. Well, some musicians, some musicians just work better that way, for sure. Some musicians refine their performance, but certainly... Like keyboard, the the shellis is the same, and the Manuel, the guitarist from Asher, is also the same. You know, we just play, like in blues, he just, uh, we know it, and so that to you. I know what he will play, and he knows how I will change it, if you're so tight in the band, you know. With Tension Dream, I could not play with Edgar anymore because the music uh, went like this, you know. But with Asher, I mean, even the music was also different. He, he played you know, uh, E2, E4, you know, yes, yeah. uh, very much with orchestra and things like that, you know. But still, when we meet, it's still the 
of uh, connection is still there, you know. So you said that you and you went in different directions musically, but I can see a very strong connection between St. Edmund Cyborg and Edmund Zeit. Yeah, at this time... Very similar. Yes, but I said in the 80s, when the, since they went to America... You know, oh, you mean you went... Okay. No, no, not at the early time. I it thought you meant by after, after electronic meditation. No, 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 later, later on when you say okay. move more, that, I think when Christoph and Peter Baumer left the band, right. and he had always changing you know, members there, and since that day, I think somewhere he got lost in, I don't know, Mm -hmm. In translation, not by <laughs> American Hollywood soundtrack hell. Normally, I think uh, uh, to do kind of a soundtrack, it's kind of, for me, it's not a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. Because you, uh, you have very really disciplined and you have only short pieces. Except on Body Love, a porno, because there is no yeah. uh, action you can play half an hour because yeah. the sex part is taking that long. There is no let's say, dialogue where you have to put down the music because it's always the same sound, you know. And uh, this is okay, but uh, this is for... Uh, but sometimes it's nice to do that because of the discipline you have. I don't like it, but sometimes you want to have just the challenge of a discipline, you know. So you say you never ever plan what you're going to do on an album? No, no. So, okay, explain to me this then. What's that diagram on the back of time with? This was afterwards. Oh, ah, afterwards. Okay. Yes, because I tried okay. to uh, to do a normal script, you know, like this on a score. Yeah. Uh, your score, yeah. Okay. But then I found how to uh, make the EMS <laughs> noises. Oh, because you know. I assumed it was on the round. I assumed that what you sat down and written that, and then you kind of realised it musically afterwards. No, no. You're saying it's the other way around. No, if you uh, read the notes uh, from Wagner, <laughs> pieces from Wagner, it was just kind of a, how it could look uh, like the abstract sounds I had to okay. kind of echo delays and things like that. Because I just wanted to find out how could you uh, document uh, electronic sounds. Mm. And I find out that uh, this is one, but it looked nice. So yeah. The guy from the record company said, I'll leave it as just as a, as a painting. Or the reason I ask is again, it's going back for me, it's going back to people like Cornelius Cardew and Stockhausen who did the graphic scores. Yeah. So for me, that seems to be another connection to that tradition. But again, it's. So, no, no, it was for me, it was just kind of yeah. of a. Uh, uh, at first, I thought, how can you make it kind of the EMS sound mm -hmm. to put yeah. them down? But I mean, even I, myself, I, I don't find the same sound the next day in right. the EMS, you know. So I thought, how should. You should uh, write it down, but I was so young and, and mm -hmm. engaged you know, that I thought you must put it back for the eternity or something like that. Do you, do, do you like the fact now that you have got total recall on a sound, or did you like the fact that before, say, in the 70s, well, you were going to the studio? Have, uh, still, I have a lot of instruments where I can't find the same sound again. Okay, and you yeah. like that, or that frustrates yes, you? Yes. you like that? Because I'm not a guy uh, doing remixes. The, the Tom uh, and other people are really always getting mad when I finish an album and just delete all the thing from a computer really? and they said, are you crazy or whatever? There was a nice sequence and this and this. I said, yeah, what for? I have a release. So I only erase it when the record is released, not before. I said, yes, because I don't do you music. You physically erase it. Yeah, just you don't even need a backup. Yeah, I know, I know that I'm so lazy. I would make the essay the same because the sequence was nice. I would take the sequence again. So there's so no way you could remix any of your albums to five point one sound. That's the reason why it never happened. Okay. Except uh, the Lisa album was uh, remixed by Schiller in Germany, but he only wanted to have Lisa's voice okay. and nothing else. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but normally it's, it's extra because I had to, I had to remix him. And so the record comes, okay, then we do it by the the same. So we exchange two mixes and then we okay. Are, it's okay. We, and because I made with him a long piece called Senit, uh, was, uh, he said, you know, he, uh, you, uh, I should play on his album. Okay. And he's, uh, he's an uh, artist who's always number one when he came out with the record. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, uh, that means short pieces. Mm -hmm. And I tried it, you know, and tried to be short, and finally the piece was 74 minutes, you know. <laughs> Which yeah. is kind of short for you. <laughs> 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 and, then, <laughs> and then I was, uh, put it on, uh, uh, on a CD mm -hmm. and sent it to him, uh, to, Germany, uh, to Berlin, and said, 
cut your fall or fire to win it out of it, then whatever you like, you can use what you want and do it like you want. And then I didn't hear from him about two weeks, you know. And then he called me and said, Klaus, you cannot cut it. Right. It is the first time that I do a piece like that, but we need, uh, we put it on the DVD with 40, uh, 34 mm -hmm. minutes, and I, uh, then we came back in my studio and we added this mm -hmm. uh, part on it. And then the, the visual of the thing, uh, because it's a DVD, mm -hmm. it's just a rebox, <laughs> <laughs> which was my echo machine in the 70s, you know. And 70s really runs uh, 34 minutes. But anyway, then it was the only time, normally nobody asked me for remixing, you know, who wants to re remix the 30 minutes. Uh, well, I'm not, think, not necessarily thinking about, you know, the, the, the sort of 80s tradition of remi dance mixes, or, but have you ever felt like you wanted to go back to, say, um, like X, for example, and remix it into 5.1 sound or something like because that? Because I, uh, I think it's the same what I do on the, on the re-releases, you know, always that I said, I want to keep them like this, and a lot of people prefer to them with kind of a, uh, to put it into the 2001 mm -hmm. or 2005 sound. Mm -hmm. I said, I think no, I, I just make them, uh, let's say, cleaner, uh, because the vinyl stuff is okay, we take the original analog tapes. But I said, I don't want to change them because uh, they're made at this time and this time. Yeah. I don't want to uh, make them... It's a snapshot in history, it's a photograph. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to go with uh, with a picture to Photoshop, you know. Right. And, uh, you know and the same is, that's the reason that uh, the new albums here, I just really erase them because I know I'm lazy. And the next time I would just, oh, there was a kind of drum, nice drum on continuum. And I would take it, I know that, you yeah. know, so as far as it's gone, I have to find something new and then it will be different, you know. That is, I know I'm very lazy, that's the case, you know. Well, I, no, I, I, I totally understand the principle in there. It's like a painter keeping all his sketches, you know. Yeah, right. You don't, you just want to see the finished work. You don't exactly, you want to see this finish, all yeah. the work in between, uh, it's, it's you should be able to throw it away. Exactly, you know. But in practice, it's very hard. To, I, I can't do that, I'm meticulous. You keep in all your pieces? Yeah, because I'm always going back and I'm, I'm a real revisionist. I go back and I remix and I make quotes and I remix. Like, remix to surround sound the last few years has been my big crazy thing, you know. Oh, yeah. um, sometimes I go back and, and uh, I hear stuff I did like five, ten years ago, and I, I cannot even recognize the person that made that music. Yeah, this is the same. I have you know, also. Yeah, it's yeah. really bizarre. Uh, when I listen, you know, through the, through the real releases, you know, I have to listen to the masters, you know. Yeah. And when I heard Ehrlich or Kriwok, you know, I said, wow. Yes, I'm believing that you dare to release such music. I said, you know, early, you know, I mean, today still would be uh, avant garde today, yeah. you know. But I said, and you went with that music? <laughs> you went to the record company yeah. and said, can you release it, you know? Yeah. And I still don't understand that they did it finally, <laughs> you know, because they did not understand anything. But do you it. like it when you hear it, or do you have like a fairly. Uh, Let's uh, say it's, uh, uh, it is like you, you watch old pictures. Yeah. You know, you think you, you see that, and you remember it, uh, the circumstances around this picture. The picture is just a trigger, you know. And so, when but is I, it a happy memory or a painful memory, or does it depend on the? Oh no, it's uh, uh, it's it's quite a let's say a funny memory, you know, that uh, because it said it must be crazy. You you have to be so uh, let's say convinced from yourself that you try that you dare to go with such a music on stage, you know, I played at this time, I played the pieces live, like early, just with one organ, and I played drum, I was a drummer before, you know, uh, on a tape, I spliced it like a loop, right. you know, and then it started to rework, so one which plays the drum loop, mm -hmm. and the, the, the organ, and then I have a, another rework which uh, is doing the delays, you know, the echo machine, you know. And then with that I went on stage and <laughs> today I would not dare to, to, to go on stage with such an equipment, you know. And, and keyboard is about the same. And the first thing where it becomes uh, more interesting was kind of picture music and then, but uh, the first thing, and then I had to go all to the releases, you know, and, and it, is, it, is, it is strange, uh, if you, you think you uh, now, let's say you're 30 years older and listen to your first album. Mm -hmm. 
And then what you and then you hear what you done with the twenty five or it was thirty, you know. And uh, like thirty I was thirty when I did Mirage. Mm. And uh, I said, God damn it, how much is it? sometimes it is like on Mirage or on X, you know, I'm really surprised that I could not make the sound again, you know. I said, God damn what was it interesting sound. How did you make them at this time? And I, I kind of had only two or three uh, synthesizer, and I had no multitracks because it, nobody could afford in the 70s a multitrack, you know. And uh, so I said, how did you do that? You know, and it was really. And today, you know, you're just a kind of. Ah, oh, you have 100 tracks if you want, and I think you have a plug in and you know, whatever, you know. And there are certain sounds there which you really cannot, uh, I don't know, you cannot uh, imagine how you did that, you know. Well, I think that's the thing, isn't it? As technology gets better and better and better and better, the music doesn't really get any better. It's all still to do with the thought process and the ideas, isn't it? Yeah, and, and more technically, the more you have to choose, you know. And, the more, and, the, and also, the, I think one of the problems with technology is it's much easier now to sound like everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. You can buy a plug-in and you can instantly get the, I don't know, the, the Nine Schnells guitar sound. Exactly. You can instantly get the, the Phil Collins drum sound. Exactly. And in the, in the 70s, it was very hard and you had boxes that didn't behave the same way any time twice. Yeah. So, and I think that's why in the 60s and 70s you tend to have a lot more, what I would call, musicians that are instantly recognisable. That's true. You can instantly recognise the guitar sound of, say, David Gilmore, Steve Howe, Steve Hillage, Jeff Beck. You can instantly recognise the keyboard approaches of the keyboard person. Now, it could be anybody. Yeah, anyone, and it probably is. And sometimes it is like that. You hear a song and say, "Oh, it's a Roland D50 sound." Exactly, you recognize the keyboard. Or something not the musician. You recognize yeah. the presets. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but not the you recognize the preset, but not the musician. And I think that's tragic in a way. For me, the last the last band really that, that every single member in the band you could instantly recognize their sound, their style was the Police. Well, yeah. Sting and his son was Stuart Copeland. Instantly you could recognise Stuart Copeland on the drums. Instantly Sting bass and his son's guitar. Since that band, I really struggle to think of a band where everyone yeah, has their, true, yeah. their unique personality. And I think, and I do, and it's, for me, it's the preset generation. Yeah, and now the bloody generation. Yeah. It's so easy. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Sometimes it's too easy that they don't be really creative. They just put all the sounds together, which sounds okay. Yeah. But if they, uh, let's say the comp uh, composition or the, the emotion, what you bring, is, uh, you know, the, there is a, the technique is a composer and the, the human is just a collector of sound, right. of the ideas, which are coming from Japanese or Spectrosonics, for example. Yeah. You know, I have to, I use this atmosphere, this uh, uh, virtual synthesizer, you know, very much. Uh, and this, this is a good thing because uh, I think it's done for me. This, uh, because when you put down a chord, it takes sometimes two minutes, you know, that it's it evolving and merging and then, and who can you do that on a single which is four, four minutes right. long to keep it two minutes just to let it, and then now they do the only spare, you know, I'm really keen on that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this was a kind of a, it's still for me a kind of genius company because the major first thing we call the start of reality, these kind of sample CDs, I use them. Okay. And then now I have used stylus and uh, Aramix and the atmosphere and then of course the, the new one, Omnisphere, because I think they wanted to go in to do a, an update from Atmosphere. And then I found out that they did so nice new stuff mm -hmm. that they said, oh, we make an extra instrument and sell it. Uh, not like an update, but just like a new instrument. This is a company, it's one of the few companies which I think they're worth for, but there's a lot of companies who just do the melatonin again yeah, and all these kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Who cares about these things, you know? But, I mean, uh, Melatron you can buy with vintage keys from the Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful Melatron. Uh, I still love the Melatron sound. It's yeah, the sound is very aromatic, you know, it's like... Mm -hmm. It's a great, yeah, it's a great. It, it's a, I, think, I think it's because it's so bad, it has a very strong character, you know. Well, I mean, I mean, it's here. 
like uh, yeah, Moody Blues or even uh, uh, Queen Crimson. Yeah, and, you know, but I mean that, that, that all comes back to what we were talking about, how you know you were saying in the early days you were so limited with your resources, what you actually had. But it just shows that music sometimes can almost benefit from limitations. Of course, yeah. I mean, Cyborg is what? It's, it's a tone generator and an organ. Yeah, and, and an orchestra through an orchestra. a cannon microphone, a very cheap one, you know. And then through the, uh, with this kind of uh, filtering, but it wasn't really filtering, you know. It was just very thin that it doesn't disturb. Uh, the, 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 the basis, you know, you have got a real re mixer. It was a torch and a telephone mixer. You know, with a with a reverb, with a spring reverb from heaven. That was my reverb. <laughs> and the delay was already okay because it was a reverb, you know. Still using it. Well, the delay was very important to all your music. Especially the delays are with yeah. the sequence. It's the a mix, yeah. it's a, I think without the sequence, especially when I had the MOOC, yeah. you know. You know, that was so funny when I went to, went to Pobel Vu, mm -hmm. uh, Florian and, uh, owned this synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And one, he said, yeah, he wanted to sell it. And uh, I knew it was a big move, but it was, you know, far out of every possibility to buy it, mm -hmm. you know. And he said uh, he was want to sell it for 20,000 marks. And I thought, wow, oh, god damn. Mm. Nearly you can, uh, but I didn't get the money, and I went to my record company. Yeah. So you must be imagine how uh, stupid or romantic I was. I went there and said, if you don't give me 20,000 marks now to buy the book, I stop making music for you. <laughs> yeah. Even we have a contract, you know, I said, no, I, I stop making music if I don't. Which record was this? Was this version? Or? No, Metronome. No. Metronome, okay. Or was it before? Uh, before. Uh, and then uh, I came there, you know, and the chief of the company, you know, he was smiling, mm. and he said, "Okay, God, we'll give you, the, uh, we'll give you the twenty thousand because uh, we want to have the music." Because at this time I was already quite famous with timing in France and things like that, so they could have get back the money, but they're not hundred percent uh, sure. Would you would you have actually followed through on your threat? Pardon? Would you have actually followed through on your threat if they hadn't given you the money? No, of course not. <laughs> okay. But I there was a bluff. Yeah, of course. Bluff. And uh, they gave me the check. Okay. And I uh, immediately went down in the, uh, from the company's house in the car, drove to Munich, right. go to uh, Florida, and I said, here, this one is found, give me uh, the MOOC. And it was in winter, it was snowing, you know, I didn't care about this, you know, I just bought uh, eight hours, ten hours driving to Munich from mm -hmm. Hamburg, and he brought me. The, it was four cases. I had the mm -hmm. big one, the, the biggest move over mm -hmm. there, and uh, he brought me three of these cases. And I said, "Hey, what? There, there's a, what's the fourth case? It was a sequence." I said, what do you mean? I think with the with the light going, oh, this thing. Oh, I don't know what I have it. I never mm -hmm. used it. He looked at the <laughs> around, you know, and said, oh, I think maybe in the cellar. I said, oh, God. <laughs> it was the important thing of the movie just <laughs> to put somewhere. So I never knew, knew, used it. And then we find it finally, you know. And then I packed it in my car, go back, directly back to uh, Berlin, you know. And after all the time, all the 20 hours in the car and uh, dealing with the company, I, I built it on, I uh, switched it on, you know, and I played it when the first sequence of color. Said, wow. And then I fall asleep in front of it. <laughs> but it, it, it was dead, I was so happy. The first time you used the big move on was, was uh, on, Moon Dawn? I, said, I think Moon Dawn. Moon Dawn. Yeah. I'm not so sure exactly. I think it was 75 somewhere, yeah. yeah. 74, 75. And then it was the, third, the first time that I had this kind of 12 oscillators. Mm. God, heaven, terrible. <laughs> but I never could work with 12 oscillators. They're all out of tune. You know, mostly you had on certain days, you have three oscillators in sync. And mm. <laughs> but always the everyday different one. Ah, this, the ninth worked with the first today. And the next day, I mean, in concert sometimes. <laughs> you know, you were playing with one hand and the other was always tuning. <laughs> so what, what was really surprising to me when you started to release the, the box sets yeah. was actually that you, you never really, or it seems to me, you never really had this concept of making albums anyway. 
you just made music all the time. And it's almost like, it almost seemed like it's brand new. You can music. choose everything, but at least still you have to have things in your mind, mm -hmm. because unless you, you, you just do some, I don't know what kind of music, like you said, you know, people just uh, taking the preset and the lovely, but for us, uh, you are not limited, I like this idea, you are not limited by packing, you are limited by yourself. But in the 80s, the standard, the quality of work drops so low, and some of those artists now have really come back and are producing great work again. And I'm trying to figure out what it was about the 80s. Now, I have my own theories, and I'm just curious about what your theories are. I think it's something to do with um, the post, the kind of fallout from post punk, that a lot of the musicians were being told that they were boring old farts and their music yeah, was both, yes. um, I think it's also to do with the dominance of major record companies in the 80s. Part of the, uh, and now, artists like yourself, who very much kept faith with their fan base, because you continued very much on your own path and you kind of cultivated your fan base through the internet, through continuing to release records which very much are your vision, I think now you're in a very good position, possibly in a, in a, in a better position than you've ever been before. It's true. It, it is, and also, when I, like I, I felt on the Love Life concert, which was quite a long period, and even before the seven years I haven't done any concert, I did only single concerts. There was one in the Royal Festival Hall, there was one on the Festival in Osnabrück, you know, and, but then the rest was nothing. I felt that the, the respect and the, uh, the love from my fans became much bigger, especially I uh, realized it in Lorelei, you know, because when we, maybe we go down and we listen later on a bit from a concert, you know, um, then you were here, I played it like a classical record, you know, a very low level, and then extremely, and then Lisa was singing, you know, and uh, so sometimes you could hear a needle falling, you know, and uh, we have all the time on the desk, we're doing just a 5.1 mixing here, it's always open to the audience, mm -hmm. and you hear nothing, right. you know, it was so uh, a kind of magic thing, and it makes it a lot of easier for me because I can play things like that. Normally, uh, when you haven't played five years or seven years, uh, the people, they are still your fans, but, uh, I mean, you know how fast you have forgotten today, you know, and it was a festival with different bands and before Tension Dream was playing, and also, and they're playing kind of a, yes, uh, full power all the time, you know, and with labels and everything, you know, and I have just pure little lights, very sensitive done, and the music which sometimes hardly was to hear, you know. And uh, so you never know really how it will work, you know. And uh, I was also uh, very anxious, I to say, very nervous, you know, because I said, oh, it would be after seven years, the first time really on stage, you know, but it worked perfect. And uh, this uh, was exactly like you said, you know, I'm now in a position where I just can do, uh, let's say, somehow everything what I want, it, at least it will be accepted. You know, whether they love it or not is a different question. Did, was there ever a time when you felt no one's listening, no one cares about That was exactly the 80s. That was the 80s, yeah. Uh, there was suddenly electronic music went down, the punk came, and came from Germany, came the new wave, so I produced the most famous band I produced, it was by accident. We never know. We did not know that it would be such a success. But uh, the electronic music was just nothing, nearly. You know. Of course, you had your die-hard fans. You have still, you know. Uh, but uh, it was not so that you have an obvious uh, audience. It was kind of people, just, some in America, some in Japan, all over the world. But uh, if you put them all together, maybe. 10, 20,000. And then, then comes in the end of the 80s, it comes the techno in Germany. And the techno people, they, in the beginning, they started with synthesizers and all that, like underground. And uh, they did not know that this, all these things are happening already in the 70s. So they started off from zero, 
And then, uh, from a certain point, uh, the big record companies realized that this is kind of a new business and pushed it, and then the, the media came, and the media said, oh, what we are doing is uh, what done by Tangent Dreams, so the Kraftwerk and uh, all before. And then a lot of these people suddenly turned around and we had new, let's say, not really fans, but new customers, you know. And, uh, but this was exactly, like you said, I don't even know what it was. I think mean, there was the Pesh Mode, Ultravox, which I liked, it's a thing. But all, a lot of bands, you know, just disappeared, you know, and what then was produced, you know, it was... I don't know what it was, it was kind of a, we, I always say La Paloma, you know, it was kind of uh, like very yeah, unengaged, you know, it's just like, yes, music always has to be there, but it was not really with the heart of something, you know, it's just kind of just to we do something, you know, that the record companies have something to sell, you know. Yeah, it's products, exactly. Exactly, yeah, you know, it's like selling soap, you know, you need a new blend of soap, okay, then you have it, you have it. Well, I think, I mean, I think that's partly why there now is a return to um, real artistry and music again, is because of the internet. You have to say, now the record companies are being made obsolete. So someone like yourself, for example, you can now have a very successful career selling to your 10,000 hardcore fans directly. Exactly, yes. Yeah, whereas if you're on a major label, you'd have to be selling 300,000, 400,000 records. Yes, they realize it, yes. And, that, and the great thing about that is it completely liberates you musically. You can do what you want. Exactly, I mean, you've yes. always done that to an extent anyway, but I think many artists before fall into that trap. And it's also, I think, nice for new artists, because mm -hmm. normally, I don't know how it's in England, but in Germany, uh, if you're not already in the top ten, you will never get a record company. But how, without a record company, how you want to get into wow. the top ten? So all the interesting new uh, new bands that don't get a deal, mm -hmm. but through the internet at least they can uh, get in touch. I mean, it's still hard for them because who is just looking for a new band when you know it's a thing? But at least they have the chance, and if they are probably, I think there will be. Uh, soon uh, record companies in the internet, mm -hmm. part of the internet, so that uh, like uh, in the early days, you know, you just could uh, go to Island Records and buy every record with, without thinking which artist right. is, because Island was such a company, you know, if they right. release a record, you can buy it. Right. It will be a different record, you know, so that it's uh, spooky too, rocking music and yeah. And this, you know, that was the reason why I went to Ireland, because it was always my dream company, okay. you know? And uh, even less money than I got from Virgin, you know, but I said, it doesn't matter, you know, mm -hmm. Ireland is a company, and then there was also Bob Marley, reggae stuff, you know, and things like that. And uh, I think these things will also come to uh, kind of internet record companies, which I like very much because now, the major companies have to be really careful. They have to do something otherwise. Before they have to kind of a monopoly, you know. Mm -hmm. They can do what they say when they say that we promote this kind of music, this will be sold because you cannot buy other stuff. But now with the internet, you know, the people can uh, go via Amazon or whatever, or directly, you know. And what I find out is that the people through the whole DVD stuff, even if we're doing mm -hmm. now DVDs, but that the, uh, the young, uh, the youngsters, they want to see the people really playing live. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because it, that's for them a fascination, what we lost because we did that already. Right. For us, the band, to see a band live, we said, no, no, no. Well, but for right, them, yeah. it is something, there is not a virtual person, there is a real yeah. person who is playing there. It's unbelievable, you know. Also, I think you're talking about the, the record label, the important record labels like Ireland. Virgin had a strong identity as well. Yeah. And I think the difference is that the major labels now have become quite faceless corporations. Whereas I think great record labels, like great bands, like great artists, have one strong personality usually behind them. In the case of Ireland, Chris Blackwell, yeah. uh, Virgin, yeah. or Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Drake, you know. And, and, uh, and in the, the 80s, labels like 4AD with Ivo Watts Russell, Tony Wilson running Factory, Alan McGee running Creation. And there isn't so many.